Hi, this is Amanda. And this is Lindsay. We're True Creeps. Where the stories are true. And the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore. To the possibly plausible paranormal. To horrifying history. To tense and terrible true crime. And everything else that goes bump in the night. We want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everyone. Today we have a really fun episode planned about ghosts that solved their own murders. Yes. I always find this kind of stuff the most fascinating, where it's a blend of paranormal and true crime. I want to hit as many different genres as we can in one episode. We're hitting them all. All of the creepy genres are ours. Every genre, all at once. We're doing it. (laughs) We're doing it, Lindsay. (laughs) Our goals. So after we're done discussing this wonderful topic, we do have some exciting Patreon news, too. So stick around at the end for that. Yeah. We're in a silly mood tonight, and this is not a silly topic. I know. (laughs) It's not. But also, we've been talking already for three hours before recording this, so. (laughs) We've been bathing shoot shopping. We've been talking about fun things to do with our Patreons. We've been talking about other fun things to do with our Patreons. Learning how to do other things. Amanda getting ready to start. Me not having the audio application open. (laughs) Also, a giveaway might be coming up. Just saying. Perhaps if you stay around to the end, we'll tell you about it. (laughs) So the first one I want to discuss is the Greenbrier Ghost. I like her name. It's got pizzazz. And her name was Elva Zona Shu. And in 1896, her name was Elva Zona Hester at that moment. She met Erasmus Stribling Trout Shoe, and they got married in November of 1986. And just to note, Elva went by the name Zona, and Erasmus went by Edward. They seemed to live a relatively normal life, with Edward working as a blacksmith. On the afternoon of January 23rd of 1897, in Greenbrier County, West Virginia, Edward asked his neighbor's son to check to see if his wife Zona needed anything from the market. And in some research, it said that the boy worked for him at the blacksmith shop, so they knew each other. When the neighbor's son walked into the house, he saw Zona at the foot of the stairs, but she didn't look like she had fallen. Interesting. At first, he thought she was asleep because she was stretched straight with one arm to her side and the other was resting on her chest. Her head was tilted to the side. The boy said her name, and when she didn't answer, he ran from the house and told his mother what he had seen. She called the coroner, George W. Knapp, and a local doctor. Before Knapp could get there, Edward had returned home. He makes a series of choices that I wouldn't have made. He took Zona's body upstairs, bathed her, and dressed her. And he picked out a dress with a really high neck that had a stiff collar. Not suspicious. No, this isn't suspicious at all. And he laid her out on the bed and put a veil over her face. This is suspicious to us, but do you remember many moons ago when we talked about Velisca and we talked about how we have very, like, modern views on, like, where a body goes after they die? They'll go to a funeral home or a morgue. They don't hang out in your house. Right. Whereas there was a time when that's where a body stayed until the next steps, right? Right. But in this time, it was strange that he dressed her. Because apparently, at least in this area, it was common for other women in the community to dress her for burial. Makes sense. So him doing it, bizarre. As Knapp examined Zona, Edward held his wife's head. I'm assuming he was like sitting on the bed and like kind of holding her head in his lap and he was hysterically crying. Which like, okay, it makes sense to be upset for sure. But as Knapp tried to examine Zona's neck, Edward got agitated and more hysterical. So all accounts that I see, Knapp was very much like, no beef, and then left. Okay. Knapp had seen Zona in the weeks leading up to her death because he was seeing her for various medical conditions. It's not very clear exactly what. I saw some things saying that it may have had to do with being pregnant, but it doesn't, she didn't look pregnant, so that would be kind of strange. When Knapp looked at Zona's body as he examined her, he saw no outward reason for her to have died. There weren't any puncture marks or there weren't, it didn't look like she had like fallen and like broken lots of bones. So he listed her death as everlasting fate. It's so whimsical. It is. It's it's too whimsical a cause of death. 
right? Like everlasting faint. I want to see that more often. Like it just sounds so delicate. I love it. So weirdly, Nat then decided to change her cause of death to complications for pregnancy. And as I had mentioned, she didn't look pregnant, which, you know, you don't always look pregnant based on like how many months you are along. But also, no one had heard of Zona being pregnant, including her mother, Mary Jane Hester. And she's going to be all wrapped up in this in a few minutes. So Zona's body was taken to her childhood home at Little Sewell Mountain to have a funeral and burial. Now, during the funeral, Edward acted sketch as fuck. (laughs) Not that he wasn't already being sketch as fuck, but... Also, like, that's, like, in our outline. Sketch as fuck. Like... (laughs) I think that's the only way to describe this. <laughs> it it really is because he's acting so bizarre. Like the least chill. I mean, I don't think it's a spoiler alert that something happened, but like the least chill, suspicious person I've ever seen ever anywhere. Yeah. Didn't seem like uh, she died of everlasting faint. <laughs> it absolutely did not. Okay. So how he was acting sketch as fuck. He was pacing next to the casket. He kept fussing with Zona's neck and her head. In addition to the high-necked dress and veil, Edward added a scarf around Zona's neck and her head. Fashion. Also, just to note, the scarf did not match, but he said it was her favorite and would want to be buried with it. Lindsay, (laughs) would you want a non-matching scarf with your high-necked dress and veil? Like, I'm going to be a fucking warm corpse, right? Like, that is what I'm thinking. Like, this is a lot of fabric. This is a lot of fabric happening. Like, what is going on? I've seen nowhere that says that this was a black dress, but in my head, it's a black dress. Oh, I was thinking, like, wedding dress with a veil. Oh, Oh, interesting. I'm thinking, like, high-necked. High-neck. Very, like, prestigious dress. Yeah. No, I well, I'm thinking high neck. Let's like white and then black rest of the dress. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I don't know why. That's where I'm at, but it is. And all I can picture is like a very, like, just very bright colored scarf that's like all fucking ratty, right? Because like, it's not like they had mass produced like fashion scarves at that point. It was like, my friend made me this. I bought this at a local seamstress. I have a scarf that matches an outfit. So like the idea that he's like, she's dressed in her finest and don't forget her ratty scarf. Right. And we're talking about the 1800s in my head for no reason that makes absolutely no sense. I was thinking like an orange and like blue, just like awful sports colored uh scarf for some reason i don't know i was just thinking oh it didn't match what doesn't match with anything orange oh no i'm thinking of like like a very like thick red scarf okay that's also tattered because it's like okay her house scarf which isn't a thing like i'm aware it's not a thing her house scarf but my (laughs) my vision of like the 1900s and before is just like so like (laughs) strange like i'm cold i must put on my house scarf i don't know i don't know and how did he wrap it around like was it like around her head and then wrapped around her neck so it was like all one piece yeah well like we're gonna talk about it in a second but i think he was trying to make it look like there was nothing to see with her neck and perhaps (laughs) (laughs) nothing to see here perhaps (laughs) perhaps <laughs> perhaps he tried to lay on the distraction a bit too fucking thick because like he all but put a sign that said nothing to see here this neck is fine stop fucking looking everything's fine like he all but did that i think that would have been his next thing to do if he had more time it's fucking wild i don't mean to make light of like what has happened to her it's more like it's just so fucking insane that all of this bananas behavior is happening and people are like hmm he's grieving like no (laughs) so he wasn't a criminal mastermind he's no chad (laughs) deball he's no chad deball anywho (laughs) <laughs> so, as Lindsay mentioned, yeah, he was trying to prop her head up. At first, he had used a pillow, and then he switched the pillow to a piece of rolled-up cloth. How did he get all this cloth there? We'll never know. Well, he was at their parents' house. So, like, it was, like, on their around their house, I think. So, like... I just... I assume he had, like, a big satchel of cloth that he brought with him to her hometown. He brought her, her house scarf. <laughs> her going-out scarf. All of her scarves. He brought all of her scarves. So most people thought he was acting strangely because he was grieving. Edward wouldn't let anyone, though, go too close to Zona. 
He was like, "Mm -mm, don't touch her scarf. So Edward was pretty well liked by everyone in town, except Zona's mother, Mary Jane. She had never liked him, and she, in her heart, knew that he had murdered Zona. Mary Jane wished that her daughter would tell her what happened, so she prayed for Zona to reveal the truth about her death somehow. Mary Jane prayed every night for weeks. And then Zona appeared to her in dreams four nights in a row and told her the same story each night about what had happened. So Mary Jane describes Zona's presence in her dreams as at first she was really bright and then she took her human form and then she could like in her dream, the room felt colder. So Zona told her mother that Edward was abusive and that he attacked her after he thought that she didn't prepare any meat for his dinner. What a reason. I mean, like, look, men who are abusive will take any fucking reason, right? Like, it's just a trigger response. Sometimes over the dumbest things, like, I wanted meat with my dinner. But so, Zona said that Edward had broken her neck. Mary Jane also said that Zona then turned her head completely around and walked out of the room. So, like, to create this image, she's, like, looking at her mom, head turns around to face the other way, and then she turns her body around so that her body is facing forward towards the door, and as she's walking out, she's therefore looking at her mom with her face on the backside of her body. Don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that at fucking all. And so Mary Jane went to the local prosecutor, John Preston, to tell him about her dream. And she was pretty insistent and she pressured him to reopen the case. I don't know whether it was because he believed her or because he just wanted her to stop coming into his office and be like, let me tell you about this dream. He's like, I have things to do. He started asking people around town about her death and about Edward. And so Knapp told John that he actually wasn't able to fully examine Zona because Edward had been hysterical. Edward's friends and neighbors also talked about how he acted strange at the funeral, probably because it wasn't appropriate at the time to say sketch as fuck. I was going to say, did they use those words? Yeah. In the 1800s, they were like, he's sketch as fuck. I I wish they would have. But so John was able to secure an order for a complete autopsy, which, of course, Edward objected to. And so Zona's body was exhumed and her body was moved to, you know, where you think the body will be moved to, the town's only one room schoolhouse. And so there her body was re-examined by two other doctors and Nap. They have like no other tables in this town. Like literally no other fucking table but where we teach children. Cool. Of course. Of course. Of course. So a local newspaper reported about what they had found in the autopsy. And this is what it said. It said, on the throat, there were marks of fingers indicating that she had been choked, that the neck was dislocated between the first and second vertebrae. The ligaments were torn and ruptured and the windpipe had been crushed at the point in front of the neck. Oh my gosh. And that's like an incredible amount of pressure that was applied. Yeah. No wonder he had the boy go to the house like to find her. Oh, I wasn't there. Yes, exactly. While it was evident that Zona was murdered, there was no evidence as to who murdered her. Great. No evidence at all. Nothing at all to suggest anyone. No house scarf or anything. So John considered how oddly Edward was acting at the funeral and Mary Jane's prediction of how her daughter had died. John began to investigate Edward and found that he had been married twice before. Now, his first marriage ended in divorce and his second wife died mysteriously after eight months of marriage. His first wife told police that he had beaten her violently and frequently during their marriage. So they were divorced while Edward was in prison for stealing a horse. While in prison, Edward said that he was going to marry seven women in his lifetime. What a weird fucking flex. Imagine that like you have no goals in life except marry everyone. Yeah, weird. His wedding to a second wife was also super sketch. Pastor Little, who was there for the first ceremony, was not a fan. During the part of the ceremony where the pastor said, if anyone has objection, speak now or forever hold your peace, the pastor said that he objected. (laughs) I don't understand why he would even like begin. Do you know what I mean? It feels like he's like, am I the drama? Like, that's what it feels like to me. (laughs) I had in my head that he was like, oh, I'll say this and for sure someone will stand up. Oh, no one's going to? Well, let me go ahead and tell you why. Yeah, yeah, fair. So Edward's like, why are you objecting? And he said Lucy was very young and she didn't have any family present at the ceremony. Also, the ceremony was taking place right over the county line and it was 1 a.m. You know, a typical normal like 1800s wedding at 1 a.m. Yeah. Middle of the night, over like random road over the county line. No bigs. Pastor Little then refused to marry them. 
Later, Pastor Little learned that Lucy was just 15 years old. Very young. Yes. The morning after the couple, Edward and Lucy, decided, hey, we'll go to Frankfurt and we'll get married there. And then eight months later, Lucy dies, which is really sad. Yeah. So John thought this was enough to bring a case against Edward. So he indicted Edward for Zona's murder. Mary Jane took the stand, but John was worried about her story about the ghost and how it would be perceived. And he also, from what I understand, he kind of tried to like sway her into not like bringing up how she knew what she knew. Yeah. But she was like, let me tell you about my ghost daughter. Not surprisingly, Edward's attorney tried to discredit Mary Jane by asking her lots of questions on cross-examination, but her story remained steadfast. So each time he asked questions or a detail, she was able to answer in the same way to show like, you yeah, know, this is actually like what, what happened. And so rather than discrediting her, the jury was like, I actually believe what she's saying because she's really holding to this story. Edward also took the stand. He told the jurors to look into his face and then say if he was guilty. And after an hour and 10 minutes of deliberation, the jury convicted Edward. So clearly they looked at his face and was like, guilty and sketch as fuck. They're like, yeah, bro, you're sketch as fuck. Yeah, yeah, you're sketch as fuck, brah. That's what they said. That was actually the little like verdict that they passed to the judge. Sketch as fuck. Yeah. Guilty of being sketch as fuck. Yeah. So the jury didn't unanimously decide on sentencing because two of the jurors refused to impose the death sentence. So he was sentenced to life in prison instead. And the town was pretty mad about this because for the most part, people thought that he should have been executed because of what he had done to his wife. And so an angry mob came to the prison to execute them himself. The sheriff heard rumblings about this and ended up taking Edward to the woods to hide him before the mob could get to the prison. However, Edward died in the spring of 1900 after an epidemic was spread through the prison. So, like, good, you died early anyway because you don't deserve to live after killing your wife because killing this many women and hurting this many people. Just, like, fuck off. There. Yeah. The theme of today's episode is the word fuck and particularly the phrase sketch as fuck. So there is another instance where a very similar thing happened, and it's with a woman named Teresita Bassa. Now, Teresita was an immigrant from the Philippines, and she was born in 1929, and she came to the United States in the 1960s. Initially, she came to the U.S. to study music, but she ended up becoming a respiratory therapist at Edgewater Hospital in Chicago. Now, that name sounded really familiar to me, so I started just Googling around a little. And I found that John Wayne Gacy was born at Edgewater Hospital. Also, Hillary Clinton. Two casual people to have had a, a weird similarity like that. Right. It's an interesting link because, you know, like, I'm sure like thousands and thousands of people are born at the same hospitals. But like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. These are the two most famous people born at this hospital. Yeah. For very different reasons. It was it was just funny that the the first article I saw or something along the lines of like, what does John Wayne Gacy and Hillary Clinton have in common? And I'm like, what the fuck do they have in common? Gotta click this. Yeah. What a question. <laughs> it's like they were born somewhere. Oh, okay. Well, that's great. Cool. So another interesting thing, though, that I stumbled upon is in 2001, the hospital was closed due to Medicare fraud. And it was a whole scandal. So they were luring homeless people, seniors, and addicts to perform medical tests and procedures on them, and many of which were not medically necessary. They were doing this in order to receive health insurance funding, and two people actually died as part of the scheme. That's insane. Yeah. That's just in fucking sane. And that's not even that long ago, right? Like, 2001 is not that long ago. No. I keep saying to myself over and over again, it's not. It's not that long? I mean, like, for a hospital in, like, a very big city? Yes. I don't know. It's just, I was like, wow, that's crazy. So, as of last year, though, the building reopened as a 155-unit apartment building. And it actually used two of the oldest buildings from the hospital that were able to be saved. I want to say the rest was all torn down, but there were two buildings that were able to be saved. Very interesting. So while she worked as a respiratory therapist, she was also pursuing a master's degree in music. So the love for music didn't go away. She was frequently giving piano lessons for free to some of the neighborhood children. So she just seemed like a sweet woman. On February 21st of 1977, her friend Ruth Loeb called her around 7.30 in the evening, and they talked on the phone for about 30 minutes. Later, Ruth testified that Teresita was expecting a visitor to come over. So about an hour after that phone call, around 8.40 p.m., neighbors called the fire department because they smelled smoke in the area. 
originally when firefighters arrived on the scene, they thought that this was just like a run-of-the-mill fire. They didn't realize what was really going on in the apartment. So once they were further in, they found Teresita's body. She was naked and she was buried under a mattress. And one of the reasons they didn't see her at first was because that mattress was on a fire. They came into the room and that's what they were looking at. When they looked at Teresita's body, there was a knife sticking out of her chest. Investigators determined later that she was not sexually assaulted. And we'll, we'll talk about that more because it's an important note. And investigators found a piece of paper that said, get tickets for AS also on the scene. So it didn't seem outwardly as though there was any motive because the home was ransacked, but it didn't look like there was anything stolen and there weren't any leads. So six months after Teresita was murdered, details emerged in a very strange and unexpected way. Maybe not so unexpected since you know that what we're talking about today, but it was certainly unexpected for everyone else. Yeah. A co-worker of Teresita's, Remy Chua, began to have visions. So her husband, Dr. Jose Chua Jr., claimed that his wife was having visions of Teresita's murder. So the visions occurred and appeared to her over two weeks, and they happened three times. So Dr. Chua said that what would happen is his wife would go into a trance, and then she would say, Doctor, I would like to ask for your help. The man who murdered me is still at large. While Remy was in this trance, she spoke in Tagalog, which is the national language of the Philippines, and had a Spanish-sounding accent. So he got the idea to ask who he was talking to. It seemed pretty clear that he wasn't talking to his wife. The person, through his wife, said, I am Teresita Basa, but they said it in Tagalog. So interesting. Also, the person who he spoke to, Teresita, so there was nothing to be scared of and begged him to help solve her murder. So after the first instance, he didn't actually go to the police because he was afraid that he would look super foolish because he had such like a weird story and he'd be like, well, my wife, she was a different person and told me about this murder. So he just didn't do anything at first. Yeah. Also, he didn't work with her. So he was like, I don't know who this is. Well, after a while in one of the trances, the voice got more insistent that he go to the police. Also, during one of the trances, a name came up, and it was a co-worker of Remy and Teresita's, and it was the name Alan Shorey. Both Remy and Teresita knew Alan from work. They also knew that he was in a tough spot, so sometimes Teresita would ask him to run her errands, and she would give him generous tips for his time. So she was trying to be a nice person and help him out. It seems like she was trying to give him money without just giving him money. Yeah, yeah. Like, she was trying to be kind. Right, and everything I've seen, she just seemed like a really nice woman. Yeah. So, investigators were unsure of how to note this in a police report. How do you? So, when the doctor finally came through and he's like, hey, I have this weird story. Here's what I know. Yeah, this isn't worrisome. Yeah, yeah. So, what they did, because they're like, I don't know how to note this, is they went to the hospital to discuss Alan with some of his coworkers. One of the investigators asked the co-workers, hey, like, do you know if Alan was ever supposed to go to her apartment? And co-workers said that he was supposed to go that evening to repair her television. And what I found really weird is like, why wasn't this brought up before? Like, why didn't they say, hey, Alan was supposed to go over there. Hey, Alan, do you, was she alive when you got there? Like, did you end up going? Yeah. That just seems like it was missed. I couldn't find any reason why her co-workers weren't asked these questions prior like was she expecting anyone not necessarily alan yeah but like was she expecting anyone was she seeing anyone was there a neighbor that came over frequently that you knew about just anything and nope this all seems very reasonable like yeah yeah just standard police work if you're gonna do with police work Exactly. So obviously when they're like, hey, yeah, Alan was supposed to go and repair her television, that put him at the scene of the murder. So of course they bring him in for questioning. And from what I understand, he went willingly. So when he was being questioned, he said he did go to repair her TV, but unfortunately he wasn't able to because he didn't have the proper tools. So he ended up going home and his girlfriend was home. Investigators had a pretty solid idea, though, and they asked his girlfriend if she had been recently gifted any jewelry from Alan. And she said, well, yeah, I, I was gifted jewelry and it was a late Christmas present. I feel like it's a very common practice that killers will gift someone close to them their trophies. Yeah, yeah. I think we talked about that. I want to say like Ivan Malat did that, but with clothes, right? Yes, so what she ended up doing is allowing Teresita's family and friends to come take a look at her jewelry. And they recognized a ring and a jade piece. So with this jewelry evidence, Alan then confessed. 
he said that he had gone back to her place. And when she turned her back, I want to say to lock the door, he put her in a chokehold and then he strangled her. He wanted to just basically rob her. So he dragged her to the living room, took off her clothes to make it look like it was a rape and a robbery. Then he went into the bedroom and he got the mattress, puts it on top of her and then lights it on fire, which is just like a very weird way to kill someone and to like hide the evidence, right? Like, I'm going to grab this mattress. It seems like panic. Yeah, it's just so weird. Very weird. So police homicide investigator Joseph Stachula later said that the only lead they had when they questioned Alan was the doctor's story. So Showery initially tried to get the case against him thrown out because the evidence came from the great beyond. Fair. The trial was dubbed the voice from the grave trial. And not surprisingly, Showery pled not guilty. Even though he confessed, though, which is wild to me. Well, he said that he confessed only after police fed him the information and threatened to arrest him and his pregnant girlfriend on murder charges. So what's true? What's not? Sometimes like we know that there have been police coercion and there've, there's been confessions because of that, right? For sure. And I could see like here's this like this very violent like murder and cover up that they're like, we want to get this solved. So I don't I don't know. There was a hung jury. After a mistrial, Showery ended up pleading guilty to the murder on February 23rd of 1979. And there's some speculation as to why he did this. Some people think that his attorney may have told him to do that because he knew that they were going to end up going back to trial and it would help him get a shorter sentence. Others have suggested that perhaps Teresita visited him as well. Maybe. She was like, I'm going to get the job done. I'm going to find my murderer. I'm going to get him in prison. And then, oh, you're trying to get away with it? No, no, no. I will haunt your ass. I'm going to haunt the hell out of you. <laughs> he was sentenced to only 14 years in prison for her murder, which wild. Not fair. No. And he was let out on parole in 1983. So if he confessed on in 1979, that's just four years. Mm -hmm. That's not enough time. I hate it. I agree. So there was a book written about the case called A Voice from the Grave, written by Chua's friend, Carol Mercado. And there's also a movie with the same name. Many people talk about how... Remy was able to give details about the murder and they have some like questions about it because they say, was it actually Teresita's spirit or did she overhear Showery talk about the crime? And then she had recently been fired from the job where she knew both Showery and Teresita. So some people think like, oh, okay, did she have an issue with Alan already? And then this was a way of like getting back at him. Yeah, some people speculated that maybe he was the reason she got let go. Like he was turning her in for things. So she was like, oh, yeah, I'll get you back. I mean, but like that feels like a, a disproportional response to losing a job is like, you'll lose your liberty because I don't like what you said about me. Yeah, that's true. I mean, but he ended up, yeah, he ended up being the killer, right? For sure. For sure. So, like, however she got this information, if it wasn't through Teresita's spirit, that's kind of sad that she took so long to come out with it, right? Yeah. So, Detective Sachua also said, To this day, I'm not quite sure whether I believe how the information was obtained. Nonetheless, everything is completely true. How weird. Imagine being him, though, and he's like, how did you solve your case? Well, let me tell you. Like, I would imagine if you're a police officer, like, getting a tip from a psychic or somebody who says they're speaking to a ghost is, like, okay, I'm happy to have a lead, but oh, fuck me. Like, how am I going to, like, how am I going to explain this? And you have to find something else, too, because if they go through every, you know, quote unquote psychic, I don't, I believe some of it. I don't believe some of it. it they have to prove it to me. Okay. We'll just say it there. Yeah. If they're like going through, there's been so many, even with like Lori Vallow, there were several that came forward that, that said that they were alive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then there is one. It, it skewed a bit, but she had a pretty similar story to what actually happened. So like, very weird. Yeah. You don't know. And I would say when a psychic is involved in more than one case and they're able to give information in more than one case, it does build their credibility. And I think a really good example of that is Christy Robinette. Yes. Oh, oh, such a smooth transition that I'm ruining right now. I'm proud of you. Extra points. Extra points. Hot damn, we're podcasters. Bam. Bam. <laughs> so... Why, yes, Lindsay, she is pretty reputable. Let me tell you about Christy Robinette. So Christy grew up in a religious household and she began seeing spirits at the age of three years old. Damn. Yeah, that's young. So 
when she started seeing these spirits, she was taught at home, school, and church that what she was seeing was wrong. Oh. She went to college, she got a great job, but she felt like she wasn't being her true self. So she decided to consult with her conservative Missouri Lutheran minister. As one does. Right, as one does. And he's actually one of the ones that first dismissed it and said, no, what you're seeing is wrong. So during their meeting, she ended up giving him her first true reading. And he told her that if she had been born a musician and never played, that she was doing a disservice to her gift and that he felt the same way about her ability to, quote unquote, bridge the worlds to help others. So I think once she like proved it, he was like, oh, wait, it sucks that he's like, this is a sin to why are you depriving the world of your gift? How selfish. And she's like, what? Right. After she like goes to college and gets this job and then she's like, wait a minute. Yeah. So I can do this. So now you're fine with it. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah. Yeah. So she has worked with a variety of law enforcement agencies, attorneys, and private investigators around the United States. And she's helped with things like missing persons, arson, and cold cases. So a couple things that she's helped out on that were super interesting is she helped on the case with Ashley Howley. And we're actually going to talk about her case in just a moment. She was also visited by another spirit from Ohio in August of 2005 that we are actually going to talk about on next week's episode because both Lindsay and I became very enamored with this case, right? Very quickly because it ties to so many things. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we looked at it and then we stopped all of our research just to keep looking at that. And then we're like, wait a minute, we need to go back on track. We will get to this. So we'll talk about that one next week. Yeah. She also got a call from the parents of a missing child, and the names were never released and kept confidential because the child ended up being alive. So the family called her, and the child was living in a group home, and she ran away, and they were really scared and didn't know where she could be. So Christy sensed that the spirit was still alive, and she was able to help law enforcement to locate the child. So if she is fascinating to you, she actually has her own website and she allows people to book time with her. And there's various methods and like various things you can book, but she is normally booked from six to 12 months advance. And I did sit there and like play with her calendar to see. I was like, is she really? And like random spots at like 7 a.m. in a few months were up, but everything else was already taken. Wow. Yeah, her name comes up anytime you're looking at psychics that help with cases. It's like, she's number one. Yeah, she is. So let's talk about Ashley Howley's case. So Ashley went missing from Columbus, Ohio on June 16th of 2004. Earlier that same day, she had called 911 to report that her boyfriend, Robert McMichael, had assaulted her. And so she had planned to go to her best friend's house to stay, but she never made it there. A month later, her mother files a missing persons report. And I think that's one of the longest periods of time that I've heard of in the cases we've covered for a person to file a missing persons case a month later. Yeah. Around the same time, about a month later, Ashley's car was found abandoned in a parking lot. And she was just 20 years old when she disappeared. So Ashley appeared to Christy Robinette about a year after she went missing. Per Robinette, she had never heard of Ashley's case prior to Ashley appearing to her. And I will say, like, we often hear, like, this person never heard of the case. And we were a little skeptical about it. But, like, I cannot tell you how many cases where someone's like, this is a very inter interesting true crime case where I'm like, never heard of it. Because we're inundated with all of this terror. So I don't find it completely insane to think that she had never heard of her case. And I want to say that Christy is located in Michigan. So that could be why she didn't know about that case either. Because, yeah, you know, it's not her area. Yeah, but she admitted that after she visited her for the first time, she did look her up. So Robinette went to the police who put her in contact with Ashley's family, which to me, that tells me just out the gate that the police trusted her. Yeah. Because I feel like they're not like a psychic. Go talk to the victim's family. At least I hope they're not. So Robinette was able to give a detailed description of what Katie had been wearing the day she went missing. Over the course of several visits, Ashley told Robinette, obviously this is per Robinette, that she had been murdered by her boyfriend and also identified where her own body was. And also, just as a note, Robinette had helped police before, so they weren't immediately skeptical, which was one of the reasons why I think maybe that's why they put her in contact with the victim's family. Yeah. So police couldn't investigate the area of where Robinette said the body was 
because it was on private property and she was the only source of that information. So I don't think they were able to get a search warrant to go onto the property. I feel like if I owned private property and they're like, we think there's been a murder, I'd be like, all right, like, here you go. But not everyone's like that. Like, come on in. Yeah. Yeah. So in 2008, McMichael was charged with the murder of both his mother and her boyfriend, which is crazy. So he just like, just made a lot of bad choices. Yeah. So in April of 2008, Ashley's remains were found in the exact place where Ashley told Ramonette they would be. Even down to the stick that Ashley said was put there as the grave marker. Gives me chills. Yeah. Her body had been encased in cement and she had been identified through dental records. McMichael was also charged in relation to Ashley's death. He received a life sentence without the possibility of parole for the murders of Ashley, his mother, and her boyfriend. I, I do find cases where we talk about psychics intervening as very interesting, but I'm always a little skeptical, like as we talked about before. But yeah, I'm always fascinated with those stories when they come up. I always stop to read them. But like I've met a lot of people in a lot of my paranormal stuff that are like, yeah, I'm a psychic or I'm a medium or I'm in tune with this or that. And I'm like, OK, cool. But there's only been a handful that say things that I'm like, wait a minute, what'd you say? Or like, what does that mean? Yes. Where I'm like, I don't have a way of them knowing that. Or it's like a specific detail that isn't like on outward appearance or like there's no way of them knowing. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever been to a psychic or a medium or have one near you? Yes to all. Only because we have we have one in the family. Oh, so we have a little uh, extra closeness to one. <laughs> and then uh, we have like years ago, Mike and I, when we first started dating, went to a silly one, like at a fair or something. Mm -hmm. And they told us about Oliver before, years before we even thought about having children. What did they say? They said that we'd have a boy and this hasn't come true yet. We'll see. But they said, well, some of it is, I guess. They said he'd have like a big personality. And Lindsay, you met him. What do you think? He does. The biggest, cutest personality. Like the little six-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. And that for one reason or another, he would be famous one day. He's unboxing videos, maybe. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Every six-year-old in the world wants to make unboxing videos. So I don't know about that. But uh, at first we were like, for good or evil? <laughs> Yeah, like I would also want to know that. Also, if you don't have children, I think that so that you can appreciate peers that do have children in this day and age, you need to just explore YouTube for children <laughs> and what types of channels exist out there. Because if you want to hear about horror, there you go. Like, I was like, can we turn this off, please? <laughs> like, it it's grating. Weird. It's weird. And like, even yesterday, we went to his book fair at school, right? You would think, book fair, totally safe. They have a whole section of all of that. Never. You're never safe. You're never safe from YouTubers, child YouTubers. No. Wild to me. Wild to me. It's not, not a bad thing, but just like, woof. It's weird. It's just weird. Yeah. And we also hired one for my 30th birthday party because it fell on Friday the 13th. So we had all of like... Love this. All of the things, all of the creepy things. And she was giving everyone readings and it was very interesting. <laughs> what about you? Have you? I, so the coffee shop I used to work at, the Long Island Medium was there and like filmed part of an episode there. Ooh. Did you get hair tips? Yeah. And I didn't get any hair tips. Ugh. I should have. I like a lot of volume. But it was interesting because whenever I watch shows with mediums where like that's what it's about, I'm I'm inherently skeptical because you're making money from doing this, right? So like anytime that's involved, I'm like, well, you have a vested interest in this being a thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so we had a person who came in every day. Like that's pretty typical. Like if you've worked in coffee or you've worked in food. Right. In a coffee shop. Like, you know, you get your regular. So I'm talking like a person who had been coming in for at least a year. I knew his order. I knew his name. She like is standing there and she's talking to us. And I'm not kidding you. She like turns mid sentence and she goes, did you lose your brother when he was young? And the guy, he was like fixing his coffee because it's like 9 a.m. Right. It's like he's like just like living his life. Right. And he's like, what? And then she's like, did you lose your younger brother when he was like a young guy? And then he's like, he hasn't said anything yet, but like everyone around is like, oh, Chuck, 
And like you can read from his face that the answer is yes. And then yeah, she's like, did he die in war? Because I, I'm, and this is like a vague recollection from a while ago, but I want to think that, that that was the way he died was that he died in war. And he was like, yes. And you know, he couldn't be planted, right? Like he's a regular. Yeah. No, he wasn't a plant because like, sure. If we had been like out in the street and I just happened to see an over like a, a, an interaction, maybe. But this was a person who I knew came in every day. And he was like just an average person. He wasn't anybody famous. It was just so strange. And so she's saying this and then she says something that's like a phrase between them. Yeah. And interesting. She's like, I love when they do that, though. He just wanted you to know he loves you. Aw. And that like he saw what you became or something like that, which, you know, I'm like, oh, oh crying but like it was it was an amazing thing to see i was like oh every time i see that happen or like hear about it happening it always like gives me goosebumps but then i'm like tell me more yeah i'm like i must know every detail and so like they went and then we're like sitting at like a table together and i was like working and doing my job and i was like the last thing i want to do is make a latte right now i want to <laughs> go wipe down a table adjacent to them and listen to what was going on. You know, like those, you're wiping the table and it's like wiping the polish <laughs> off as you're. I'm just like scrubbing one spot and like staring, yeah. reading their lips. Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, perfect. So speaking about what we want to do, <laughs> uh, let's talk about some fun stuff. So stick with us in a look for, just stick with us for a moment because we're going to talk about a giveaway in a second. But before we do that. We wanted to talk about Patreon and some Patreon anniversaries. So first up, we have a Patreon. If you don't know, we try not to talk about it every episode because that's annoying, right? We do have some Patreon anniversaries and we just want to say a special thank you to all of our Patreons. But when you hit that one year mark, it just, it just feels extra special and we appreciate you so much. But so this month, Gina, Jessica, Blair, Teresa, Kendra, and Chloe have all been patrons for a whole year. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. <laughs> we appreciate you so much. And for less than three cents a day, <laughs> you could be a mitten. So Amanda's going to tell you about our different Patreon peers real quick. And I'd like to point out again that after this, we're talking about a giveaway. So I'm very excited. Yes. I cannot stress this enough. <laughs> so we have a bunch of different tiers. Our first one is the Mittens tier. And it's only a dollar a month. And you get access to our Bat Bonfire, which is our Patreon-only Facebook group. And we actually just made a Discord just this day. <laughs> We should have been recording, but we made a Discord instead. And we made little emojis that are our ghosts that are also our tattoos. Yes, we did. We did do that. So it's a lot of fun, though. We talk about episodes, questions, cases that people are interested in, silly memes, just everything is in there. And we'll be on our Discord, hopefully. We also have our Dump Ghost tier, and that's $5 a month. And you get access to the Bat Bonfire. Also, you get a sticker when you join and you get a new sticker every year on your anniversary. So those that have the anniversaries, make sure to check your mail. I'm so excited about these stickers. Oh my gosh. They are wonderful. I'm so excited. Yeah. And we normally send everything out at the end of the month. So just a heads up, it'll probably be in a couple weeks, but we'll give you, we'll give you an update in the Patreon. So our other tier is the Fire Yeti and that is $8 a month. And you get all the things I've talked about, access to the Bat Bonfire, Sticker when you join. Sticker every year on your anniversary. But wait, there's more. But there's more. <laughs> you also get an annual custom fall card. And if you join by September 15th, that's what, how you'll get your card. And it encompasses a lot of our episodes in this beautiful card. I loved it. This, this last year, it was gorgeous. Yeah. I think we've discussed it as frameable art. As as the artist on this bad boy, I would say it's frameable art, but at the very least, it's a fun exercise in like picking out all the jokes. Like if you, especially if you listen all the time or listen occasionally, you're going to pick something up. Yeah. Like that's hidden in this card. And our last tier is the Vortex Bouncer at $25 a month. And you get everything I've discussed before, but you also get a t-shirt or now just added or a tote when you join, and then yearly on your Patreon anniversary. All very exciting. And just also as a note, if you're getting something on your anniversary each year, it's going to be different than the one you got. Yeah. So we're keeping track of like the first year everybody got the stickers that they got were the dump ghosts. So this year, the sticker that everybody gets is going to be different. We've been teasing this giveaway, so let's talk about it. So we're going to be giving away one of our totes. 
We're going to share a post with all of the details on how to enter on Facebook and Instagram, but you'll be able to get entries to win the tote by following us on social media, tagging us in your Instagram stories, if your Instagram's public, otherwise we can't see you, or being a current Patreon as of May 31st. And again, we're going to post about how to enter, so just keep your eyes peeled for it. And then just also as an added exciting thing, we're always dreaming up new ways to have fun with our patrons. One of the things I was doing a, a virtual game night, I'm really looking forward to that. So if, if there's something that's holding you back from being a patron that you're like, I wish they did this, or if you've got stories, if you've got things you want, tell us. There's been a few. Yeah, we've been tagged in some really cool things that will be episodes in the future. So thank you to those that have been doing that. We get super excited. And then normally one of us, whoever sees it first, is like, oh, my gosh, look at this story. Or, oh, my gosh, look at this case that someone tagged us in. It is fascinating. Then we stay up all night reading about a case that we're going to do in two months. So do that to us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the best part of True Creeps is being creepy with a group. Like, I think that's that's what we love. So creep with us. We want it. Yeah. And if you win the tote, then we'll be able to creep with you. <laughs> <laughs> and also with you <laughs> yeah and just think of all of the fun things that you could carry in this tote like a haunted doll a miniature rocking chair a basilosaurus figurine and basilosaurus goods do exist Lindsay has sent me a notebook yes because what else does someone want to put their notes in other than a basilosaurus notebook i can't think of anything you know what? maybe we'll make him into a notebook for our merch store so we are always looking to grow, too. So I know Lindsay said, shoot us a message if you have any suggestions. We love them. Also, remember to like, follow, subscribe, and also share with your friends, because that is another way to also have a fun conversation at work. Or Those are the conversations I want to be having. Those are the, those are the ones. Exactly. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. So with that, though, uh, that's all of our new information that we're working on. We wanted to share with you guys. So have a good weekend. Thanks for creeping with us. Thanks for listening. For more information on our sources, please visit our website, truecreeps.com. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can follow us on Instagram at truecreepspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash truecreepspod, and on Twitter at truecreeps. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps.